G'day everyone. I hope you're all enjoying your quarantine. <laughs> um, today on the bench, I've got something a little bit different. I know it's not a Makita, <laughs> although that wouldn't be a bad thing. Let's unbox it here. Pull it out. This box away. And here it is. A better view for you. It's a really nice shape. This is a uh, MAS eleven ten. All Bakelite, nineteen fifty one model. They still hadn't. Uh, added the on off switch onto the volume control so it's separate which is quite strange but I guess that's how it was at the time broadcast band only it's in really good shape I'll give you a close up here it's uh, really nice like <laughs> squeaky clean Really nice shape. Fortunately, the uh, some of the white paint is starting to come off, but that's, that could be fixed up quite easily. Um, I have already taken a look inside, so that does spoil it a little bit. But um, spin it around here. It's just a standard five valve radio. You can see. Uh, Mallard Australia and uh, aerial and earth leads attached there. I've forgotten if this has a uh, fer ferrite antenna in it, but I don't think so. Get a screwdriver here and uh, we'll get it open. Right, pull off the back panel and we'll take a closer look. Alright, taking a look inside, I've already spotted something. The old felt pad. One of the knobs somehow managed to get in there, I don't know how. There's little bits of... I don't know what you would call them, they're not really plastic. So what are we dealing with in here? Well, you've got a Philips Mini White 6x4. That's all right. So obviously that's a replacement. This is a uh, well, early Philips Mini White 6 CM5. These are really old replacements. Very early. Uh, 6N8, made in Holland. That would be a uh, original valve from the set. Um, that obviously hasn't been replaced. This guy here, also a 6N8. This set has two 6N8s. Um, also an original valve. And last but not least, the guy back here. And that's a uh, Mlad 6AN7. So, get that back in there. Unfortunately, the, the sockets are just the cheap Bakelite sockets, but that's alright. Interesting here, look how tiny that. Uh, tuning capacitors and that actually has the production date of it on it 12th of June 1951 there you go speaker's quite nice quite large 
Transformer looks alright, although it's yet, yet to be seen if it's not shorted or anything yet. Curious about these two um, Jukon capacitors back here. They're both 24 microfarad, 350 peak volt. Um, interesting how they state the peak fault but not the continuous operating, I guess. Unless they do mean peak working voltage, I don't know. Yes. Anyway, let's uh, pull out the chassis and uh, take a look at the underside. Interesting that someone's cut the uh, old power cord which you can see is made of the old vulcanized rubber anyway all right it's out of the case um, so we can take a bit of a look at it now rotate it around a bit can uh, get a bit of a look at those jukons there you can see the 24 microfarad you can see the tiny tuning capacitor and it's big wheel on it it's interesting, I just noticed that it's actually uh, foam on this. It's a combination of rubber and foam as insulation, which is and shock absorption. I've uh, never seen that before. It's amazing, it's still in one piece considering it's probably the original foam from, you know, 1951. Spin it around here. See the front face. Three screws that hold the front felt to the front of the Bakelite case. Really good to see that the uh, glass plate is still intact, although uh, now I know where those chunks of plastic are from. And uh, I should remove this glass plate. Now you have to be very careful with this because it's um, well the actual station um, the text on it is all made is all turned to dust. See how easy that slid out? It's very important. And there's a little bit of felt on the uh, dial there and it's important that you don't let that want to touch it because it will just instantly rub it off as it seems to have already been doing to a lesser extent you have to be very careful push the dial pointer up and lift it out have a look at that could do with a bit of a cleaning on the front. I wouldn't dare touch the back because it would just come straight off. But yes, they are weird little bits of plastic. I don't know. I don't know what actually is some early plastic of some description. Put that in a safe spot, and uh, now we can spin it back around. Have a look on the underside. And would you have a look at that? Getting close here. From what I can tell. It's a uh, completely original radio. Not a single one of these capacitors looks to be changed, although this Hunts might not be original. But I'm not sure about that guy down in there. That's a bit of an odd one of the bunch as well. Don't know who that's made by, but it's in some sort of plastic casing. But It's made in Australia. I'd be interested to see what it is. The rest of these are just uh, um, Jukon capacitors with some sort of tar in, injected into them. 
um, obviously to try and keep oxygen out of them. Interesting here, this is a, let's have a look, let's see if we can rotate the paper. That is an old UCC electrolytic. You won't hear about UCC anymore, that's for sure. 10 microfarad, 40 volt. And I'll tell you what, by today's standards, that is a massive capacitor for what it's rated for. Um, this would just about certainly have to go. I don't know about those Jukons, but it's interesting. This is actually used on the uh, BIOS. Certainly not very often you see a BIOS capacitor on a 5-valve radio, but in this instance it does have one. Get a closer look in here. And this guy, 0.01. And that. And uh, it's got a cross between older and modern encoded resistors. Get a better look at them up here. You can see the old bed type resistor and the more modern color coding resistor used up to this very day. So this is called bed type um, resistors, which body and dot. So two zero uh, five is the multiplier. So two zero five so it's a two meg. 2 meg resistor, 2 of them there and uh, see for instance brown, black, yellow, uh, yellow that's a 100k another one down there yeah it's quite interesting In um, they seem to actually put maybe a little bit of paint on the pins after they may have verified each connection or something. So you can tell that it's all original in here. This capacitor here, I believe that's what it is, some sort of micro capacitor perhaps. First thing I want to do just for fun, I'm going to desolder the connection on one of these electrolytics and we're going to test it on this guy over here. Okay, so there's a bit going on here, but I'll explain it. Over here we have the uh, capacitor tester, which is just a variable high voltage power supply that reads down to the microvolts. Up here I decided we to have some fun and use an AVOmeter. And this all runs over to the first filter capacitor. Um, of course it doesn't connect to the chassis because it goes, the filter capacitor goes from B plus all the way down to the negative bias. So, otherwise we'd be going through a resistor, and because we don't want that, we want to get an accurate reading of how the capacitor tests. Of course, we want to be straight across it. This uh, voltmeter is not very accurate, that's why I'm using the AVO. But... Um, it should have power applied. Yes, it does. The AVO is on the 25 volt scale, so you can see that it's floating around the 12 volt mark. Start to raise it. Yeah, we go to the 100 volt scale. Rising it up. Right over 60 volts, keep going. There's about 100 volts. Um, go to the next scale, 250. Leakage current at, what's that, about 14, 130, 120, 110, uh, that's about 105 volts. So that's uh, the 1 milliamp scale. That's the one milliamp scale, sorry. Bit of movement there, so it's just under 400 microamps. So the capacitor is actually reforming pretty well already. Jiggling around a little bit there, but 
slowly dropping. So I'll let the capacitor sit there on the uh, on the capacitor tester for 40 minutes, and uh, it's not bad. This is on the 100 microamp scale, so it's pulling going all all over the shop a bit there, but anywhere between 60 and 80 microamps, which is uh, within tolerance of the capacitor specs, I believe. Whilst I wait for a replacement electrolytic, I'll leave the one that's in there in there for testing. Um, I'm not too concerned about it while I test it. It's already reformed, so... Worst case scenario is it um, shorts out, but I'll be monitoring it the whole time. Well, there they are. <laughs> All nine of the carcasses, <laughs> I guess you could put it. The old capacitors. This Hunt's capacitor is obviously the only one that's been replaced. This one here is a 0.002 UCC paper molded. Made in Australia. There you go. That one, this is what it looks like. I've got it on an angle so it takes the weight off the tuning capacitor. Um, the UCC was the one right up in there, that guy there. That was a bit of fun getting in. The hardest one was definitely this guy to replace. Um, this of course is your choke under here. Two Jukon electrolytics. It's interesting. You can better see the different designs. So that's I think that's the older design, and you can, you can actually see the red seal. And this one they actually have a bakelite base on it. This one you solder to the chassis. This one you screw. So I I'm going to replace this UCC. I've uh, got a capacitor I can replace it with. See, so it's a 40 peak volt. 10 microfarad. Um, interesting that this says it's made in Enfield in New South Wales, but <laughs> that's not where this other UCC cap is made, as you can see there. So either they moved um, plants or they actually just had a separate plant for making electrolytics. That's either one is a possibility. Alright, so I just went ahead and replaced all the uh, wax capacitors inside of it and put in a new mains cord, as you can see in there. Um, just put a zip tie around it so you can't reef it out the back. Um, added, obviously I used a 3 pin cord so it's got earthing now, which also means that the radio is safer than it ever has been. And I also replaced the wiring going to the pilot lights, as you can see there. Replaced the old stuff. It runs right over to the other side to the other light. Here's the piece that went from the underside. And, uh, well, it looks alright. Until you get a close inspection, realise just how dry and crumbly it is right, it's just that's a pretty good visual demonstration why you should replace that wire I think <laughs> it's uh, not too good these days it's weird with this the on the on position is left Bit of hum in there. That does seem to be working.
But we're not going to get anything over here because one, it doesn't have an antenna, and two, this room is shielded, so we're going to have to move the radio to see if we can pick up anything. So I'll move it and we'll be back. Okay, so I connected a crude little aerial that you can see out there. Leading straight up to the radio and um, I can tune in, I think it's the ABC, but just have a listen. That's about maybe a weak tube. I'm not too sure actually. Well, it seems I bit the bullet about a bad or weak valve a bit too early because I extended the antenna and actually managed to tune in a few stations. Uh, it was still a bit poor, but it does work. So I uh, went ahead and a bit closer here. I replaced a few of these resistors in here because I've discovered after I uh, grabbed uh, another multimeter they can check resistance uh, accurately unlike the AVO over here which I doubt they'd be very accurate by now but even if it was accurate I'd struggle to understand it um, and I discovered this uh, sky right here it's 150k that's reading Oh, about 217k, something like that. So here, here's the old one. And if you get on the meter, there you go, 220k. So it's a bit out, <laughs> and uh, that sure wouldn't have been helping coverage that much. So I changed the outer tolerance resistors and that, and it took me a couple of hours, and. Um, of diagnosing and all that and then I decided that it's probably a good idea to do an IF alignment on it so I hooked up uh, my old signal generator over here and the peak um, the peak frequency response from the radio was at 460 which uh, it's supposed to be 455 and um, and I just did the uh, realignment on it here. As you can see, that's what it looks like on the screen now. I'll get the lab bench power supply cord out of the way. Wouldn't be a bad idea. And so it's it's at its peak now. It's peaked at 455 kilohertz, where it should be. Um, see if I go back up in frequency, it drops back off. That's about 460 there. Now it used to be where the peak was until I realigned it. And now the peak's right about there. Which is right on 455. Um, now the trick is when you realign these uh, sets, they normally actually put wax inside of the slug tuners and um, it's very easy to break these slug iron core uh, iron cores, they're quite easy to break and and the wax, the trick is, is to um, just apply a little bit of tension a little bit of tension, stick it in, just put a little bit of tension and you'll feel it kind of break the wax break and you'll be and it'll free up and you'll be able to tune it around. So the key is not to just put force too much force on it straight away, just a little bit and you'll feel it break free. Um, you want to be very careful with that and of course not use a metal screwdriver. Um, to couple it, I 
Now with the oscilloscope here, I actually just got a bit of um, what is it? Heat shrink, and I just cut it up the middle and slid it onto the um, lead coming from the last IF can to the detector plate and insulated it with the piece of heat shrink. I didn't use the heat shrink to melt it on because it doesn't need to stay there. Um, I'll show you the schematic here. This is where I connected it across here to the detector plate just with a bit of insulation so the oscilloscope wouldn't drag down the circuit. There's only a couple of picofarad capacitance um, so I wouldn't drag it off frequency too badly because that's the main thing you don't want to tune it with the oscilloscope connected directly otherwise you'll be tuning it out of circuit as soon as you disconnect the oscilloscope and don't want that so that's why I did um, next thing we'll do I guess we'll hook up the extended piece of wire and we'll see what we get now Hopefully it's a fair bit better. Okay, I've let the radio warm up for a little bit and uh, connected the extended antenna. Now which is way over there by the gun bed, but um, yeah, it's not doing too bad considering it's just a piece of wire on the ground. Um, let's start at the top of the band here and you will listen. gives you a fair idea of what I'm getting out here with a piece of wire on the ground. I live a fair way away from Melbourne, so a bit over a two hour drive, so it's not really surprising it's this week with just a piece of wire, but yeah. With a proper setup I reckon this would tune in pretty decent stations, especially at night. You know, it's only half past three in the morning at the moment. 
So, yeah. I think that will do it for part one. Part two is when we'll clean up the case and, re and uh, replace some of the decaying rubber and that on the tuner and, and uh, try and sort out a solution for the dial glass. That's probably the most important piece. Maybe polish up the baker light, make it look real nice, and that'll be it. Anyway, see you then.